March 12th marks the 26th anniversary of the Helms-Burton Act, a law that reinforces a blockade imposed by the U.S. government to Cuba since 1962. And Ukraine President Vladimir Zelensky stated that he is ready to begin negotiations with Russia and emphasized the need to receive security guarantees. Venezuela ratified to the European Union its disposition for dialogue and demands the lifting of unilateral sanctions. Hi, this is From the South. I am your news anchor, the Oban team from the Telstar Studios in Havana. We begin with the news. On Saturday, March 12th, this marks the 26th anniversary of the Helms-Burton Act, a law that reinforces a blockade imposed by the U.S. government to Cuba since 1962. Since the so-called Law for Cuban Freedom and Democratic Solidarity, also known as Helms-Burton, came into effect in 1996, it has served as a mechanism through which the U.S. government imposes illegal and brutal pressures to hinder and interrupt its commercial and investment relations with Cuba, with the purpose of suffocating the Cuban economy and increasing the shortages among its population. According to specialists, this law, together with the Torricelli Act that signed in 1992, represent a huge obstacle to a stable, institutionalized, lasting, and irreversible relationship between the two peoples. They also mean the violation of the principles of sovereign inequality and non-intervention in the internal affairs of a state, principles considered by international law as mandatory norms. In Peru, President Pedro Castillo requested to address the National Congress to present his message next Tuesday, the day after the preliminary debate of a motion of vacancy. Castillo's request was announced by Prime Minister Aníbal Torres by means of a document backed by a constitutional norm that states the head of state may address messages either in person or by written form to the legislative body as he considers convenient, in addition to the annual message when first legislature begins. The request is also closely related to the impeachment process that will be debated on Monday once the legislative body discusses the, the presidential vacancy motion is admitted for debate and if it is approved or not, while the head of state or his lawyer will have to exercise his defense before the body. Opposition congressmen who presented the vacancy motion hope to reach the two votes needed to complete the 52 required for the motion to be debated. As well, President of Peru, Pedro Castillo, held a bilateral meeting on Friday with his counterparts from Argentina and Bolivia, Alberto Fernandez and Luis Arce, respectively, as part of his visit to Chile, where he participated in the inaugural ceremony of President Gabriel Boric. During the meeting with Fernandez, both dignitaries discussed several issues of the bilateral agenda, especially referring to health and education. A Peruvian Argentine social cabinet to strengthen cooperation in these sectors was not ruled out. With his Bolivian counterpart, Castillo addressed the implementation of the energy cooperation agreement signed in 2021 to supply Bolivian LPG to Peruvian population populations and connect the Bolivian gas pipeline with a future gas pipeline in southern Peru, as reported Agencia Andina. In Brazil, the oil company Petrobras announced an increase in fuel prices. Petrobras announced an 18.8% increase in the price of gas on Friday, whereas diesel rises and is set to hit a 24.9% increase mark. This is the biggest fuel price escalation since January 2021. The mostly state-owned petrol company said in a statement that price increases by other fuel providers have prompted this measure. The executives conveyed that for almost two months they managed to not raise the fare, and they recalled that the Brazilian Senate approved a bill to support gasoline prices remain steady through a stabilization fund, as well as an assistance plans for those most affected by the measure. In Argentina, social organizations and LGBTQI plus activists joined relatives and friends of trans young man Tawel de la Torre as this Friday, March 11th, marks the first anniversary of his disappearance. The collective's outcry one year after Tawel's disappearance also joined the gathering of over 11,000 signatures to endorse a petition that demands to the authorities the use of all resources available to find him and ask the media to continue broadcasting Tawel's case. His family has repeatedly denounced defaults in the case as the orange alert was issued three months after his disappearance when it should have been issued five days later. What's more, a specialized police body did not carry out the searching activities. His relatives also denounced that the authorities always assumed that Will died, so never assessed the evidence pondering the possibility of him being alive and kidnapped or restrained. The campaign of the United States and that country's media has unleashed a real wave of Russophobia not only against President Vladimir Putin, but more absurdly against the Russian people. Contrary to this situation in Venezuela, the people assure that they will continue to welcome all Russian citizens. Our correspondent Marlene Garcia gives us more details.
The drums of peace beat in the populous community of St. Augustine in Caracas, the capital of Venezuela. It is the Wawanka flavor which once again embraced the Russian tourists who since September 2021 are visiting the country as part of the bilateral agreement with Russia on tourism. <laughs> Welcome Russian brothers, one could hear from the balconies. It is the main message at a time when Russophobia has been promoted by the Western media. And I do not believe in the United States because those people have always waged wars in the name of freedom, in the name of freedom of economy for so many things. And that is false. They are in it for their own interest, killing. The biggest killers are the United States in different countries of the world. This tool goes beyond the exchange of cultures. It is the feeling, the warmth and the color of the Venezuelan people who has suffered the illegal sanctions of the United States that are now also imposed on Russia. Many Russophobia sees all over the world. The media wants to become a big court, but a court of lies, a court of falsity. It is a simply media campaign that tries to undermine the profound truth that the Russian people are taking on today, which is to fight against racism, to fight against this fascist enclave that has tormented, raped, and mutilated the community of Donbass. So main aggression against the Russian people stop. That racism stop our Russophobia as well. Russia has been sanctioned by the United States and it's a lie. Its planes are not allowed to fly over Europe. But the operation will not stop. Flights are going to increase to and from Venezuela. Now with the Venezuelan state airline Conviasa, cooperation is intact. Russia Airlines flights are suspended. They have requested for seven flights a week, and we are working from now, starting on April 1st, to have three flights a week. Direct from Moscow to Port Lamar, apart from the regular flight from Moscow to Maiketia, which is every 15 days and will increase in number soon. In almost six months, more than 50,000 Russian tourists have come to Venezuela. The goal is to reach 12,000 monthly. Madeline Garcia, Telesur, Caracas, Venezuela. We're going to take a short break now. Please join us again after this. Hi, and welcome back to From the South. In Ukraine, President Volodymyr Zelensky stated that he is ready to start negotiations with Russia and emphasized the need to receive security guarantees. During a press release, Zelensky reiterated his hope that the peace process will begin to be put into practice and will not remain only in words. He also stressed that Kyiv needs security guarantees in spite of the fact that Russia had previously been denied such requests by the U.S. to prevent NATO expansion. He also reported that he asked Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett to hold talks with Russia in Jerusalem since the three rounds of talks between Russia and Ukraine have already been been held in Belarus. In Norway, Defense Ministry authorities announced new military maneuvers by the North Atlantic Treaty Organization named Cold Response 2022. In statements to the press, the Norwegian Defense Minister Odd Roger Enoksen informed that exercises will begin on March 14th and will be extended until April 1st. They will be carried out in a territory close to Russia in the framework of the conflict between the country and Ukraine. These maneuvers will have 30,000 soldiers, 200 airplanes, and 50 ships from NATO member countries, as well as troops from Sweden and Finland, non-NATO nations. In this regard, Moscow Embassy in Oslo issued a statement saying that the reinforcement of NATO's military capabilities near Russia's borders does not contribute to strengthening the security of the region.
The Russian Federation Council accused the United States of preparing a coup d'etat against the self-proclaimed People's Republics of Luhansk and Donetsk. The deputy chairman of the Federation Council, Konstantin Kozachev, denounced that the exclusion of sanctions against the People's Republics promoted from the United States suggests an attempt to destabilize these territories. The parliamentarian considered that the actions from the United States Treasury Department from where transactions were authorized for alleged non-governmental organizations in the republics in view of the progress of the special operation to protect both nations prove Washington's intentions in the region. The vice president of the council pointed out that the United States did not see the need to promote NGOs in the territories during the eight years that the Kiev government persecuted and shot citizens living in Donbass. The United States reported that it is enabling new logistical and administrative channels to expedite arms shipments to Ukraine and other European nations. Pentagon spokesman John Kirby explained at a press conference that due to the growing demand for military equipment from allied countries in Europe, the Pentagon has decided to create a special team for this purpose while working on mechanisms to reduce the required bureaucratic procedures. Military analysts point out that Washington is conducting this activity simultaneously with the increase of tensions in the region to force Ukraine and other allies to take loans and buy weapons at inflationary prices. In Russia, the Defense Ministry spokesman Igor Konashenkov reported that the armed forces of his country destroyed over 3,400 military targets on Ukrainian territory. The official detailed that the figure includes three anti aircraft missile systems, eight command and communication centers, five ammunition and fuel deposits, and 78 warehouses for military equipment. In addition, there will have been eliminated 123 drones as well as 1,127 tanks and armored vehicles, 115 multiple missile launchers, 423 artillery guns and mortars, and 934 units units of special military vehicles. The Russian government has repeatedly stated that its military operation is aimed at the demilitarization of Ukraine and does not represent a threat to civilians. The Russian Defense Ministry released an audiovisual material showing Russian armored vehicles moving up very fast towards Kyiv. The images were shared through the ministry's official social networks. Also from Moscow, they affirmed to have advanced 26 kilometers in the last 24 hours. In the last days, the Russian army began its advances around the Ukrainian capital, both from western and eastern flanks. According to the latest report from British intelligence, the Russian forces are deployed 25 kilometers away from the Ukrainian capital with the aim of closing in around the circle around it. A humanitarian corridor was opened to bring food and medicine to Mariupol, a city in southeastern Ukraine besieged for 12 days. The crossing was opened by Ukrainian authorities in agreement with Russian military forces as part of the agreements reached by both parties in dialogues held in Belarus. According to the report, more than 90 tons of food and medicines were transferred through the corridor. Moscow and Kiev agreed upon the opening of up to seven humanitarian corridors to evacuate citizens and provide food to cities affected by the conflict in Ukraine. However, these corridors have not operated as expected and both sides are accusing each other of blocking them. The implementation of sanctions against Moscow by the European Union brings consequences for the countries that make up the bloc. In Germany, there is concern about the drastic increase in fuel prices, according to the transport sector. According to the government, more than 70 percent of the fuel supply in Germany is transported by trucks, mainly by medium-sized transport companies, which are the hardest hit by fuel prices. Now, Dirk Engelhardt, spokesman for the German Federal Association for Road Transport, Logistics and Disposal, said the increase in the cost of oil threatens the transport and logistics industry. He also pointed out that he considered extreme increases in fuel prices occurred so quickly that some of the association's members were unable to pass on these costs, putting them at risk of insolvency. The situation for Mika Roll Holosh business has never been this bad. The extreme rise in fuel price is a huge problem for our members. They cannot hand down these prices fast enough and are therefore threatened with insolvency. We have more news coming up after a final short break. Please stay with us.
Hi and welcome back. Venezuela ratified to the European Union its disposition for dialogue and demanded the lifting of unilateral sanctions. In Turkey, Venezuela's Foreign Minister Felix Plasencia held a meeting with the High Representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Joseph Borrell, in the city of Antalya on Saturday during the second diplomatic forum that transpired in that Turkish city. In the meeting, Plasencia reaffirmed Venezuela's demands to lift the unilateral coercive measures that affect the fundamental rights of the Bolivarian people. The talks between Plasencia and Borrell transpired in the context of this second diplomatic forum in Antalya, which will be in session until Sunday, March 13th, under the slogan, Recodification of Diplomacy. On Saturday, Turkmenistan held anticipated presidential elections, which were to be held in 2024. Polling centers open at 7 a.m. and would remain open until 7 p.m. local time. A total of 2,577 polling stations were set up in the country for the presidential elections. Nine candidates are on the electoral ballot in a nation with some 6 million inhabitants. Analysts have uh, as a favorite candidate Sardar Berdi Mujahidov, 40 years old, who serves as deputy prime minister in charge of economic affairs, and who is the son of current head of state Gurbanguly Berdi Mujahidov. Former Zambian President Rupia Banda died on Friday, aged 85. Rupia Banda died after a long battle with colon cancer. His son Andrew Banda announced the former leader's death on Friday. Banda was Zambia's fourth leader since independence from Britain. He served for three years from 2008, a term remembered for economic growth and corruption allegations. Zambia's economy expanded mainly on the back of rising copper prices and a surge in Chinese investments. Zambia recorded a 7.6% increase in growth for 2011, up from 6.4% the previous year, for which Banda took credit on that time. In Kenya, at least five people died when a terrorist attack in the coastal city of Lamu in southeast of the country. According to police authorities, four of the diseased persons were hired workers from the construction company for Chinese communications who were working on a highway section over the Kwao Molo Bridge in the Boni Forest 460 kilometers east of Nairobi. Another of the victims died while riding a motorcycle in the area at the time of the attack while four other people were injured. According to the source, Kenyan security forces are investigating the incident perpetrated by a commando of the Islamic extremist group Al-Shabaab whose members run into the Boni Forest. A military operation is currently underway to capture them. Kenya's government announced it was lifting the remaining COVID-19 restrictions, including a requirement that people wear masks in public places and a ban on large indoor gatherings. But authorities said Kenyans should continue heeding public health measures such as washing their hands and social distancing. The announcement comes after almost two years since Kenya introduced the public health measures. The decision was taken following po uh, positive rate, low positive rates that have persisted for over two months and with the number of fully vaccinated people about to hit 30 percent of the adult population. According to statistics, close to 8 million people in Kenya have been fully vaccinated, while the positive rate as of Friday was 0.3 percent. Since the first case of COVID-19 was detected in the country in 2020, the East African country has recorded over 323,000 cases and more than 5,600 deaths. In keeping with the guidance from the World Health Organization, the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, and the epidemiologic situation prevailing globally, the Ministry of Health has therefore revised the measures. The measures that we have announced today may be reviewed at any time, and the Ministry of Health can administer ad hoc measures, including arrival testing, based on prevailing pandemic situations and epidemiologic situation of the country of departure.
Cyclone Gombe left so far 10 people dead and thousands affected after hitting Mozambique and Madagascar. According to the Meteorological Service of Mozambique, the Cyclone Gombe hit the province of Mampula during the night from Thursday to Friday with strong winds, which would have reached 160 kilometers per hour. Among the victims caused by the storm was a child crushed in the collapse of a house in the town of Monopole, bringing the death toll in Mozambique to eight. Authorities reported that previously the cyclone left two dead in Madagascar and nearly 1,000 people affected. Southern Malawi is expected to be hit by strong winds, with Gombe now as a tropical depression. And we've come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find these and many other stories on our website at Telstra English. You can also join us on social media for all the latest news from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telstra English, I'm Diomantin. Thanks for watching.